Hello, I'm Geraldine Moses. Welcome to this program on complementary medicines, the best advice. In Australia today, over 60% of people use some kind of complementary medicine. To help consumers use them wisely, it's important that health professionals are familiar with these medicines, as they are pharmacologically active substances with the potential for adverse reactions and drug interactions. However, surveys indicate that only half of all users inform their medical practitioners about their use of complementary medicines. So health professionals also need the skills to encourage consumers to disclose their use and make rational decisions about the potential benefits and risks in managing their health. This program looks at these key issues, including the quality, safety and efficacy of comp meds. We're not going to be judging whether specific remedies work or not. Our focus is on skills for health professionals to help their patients. We want you to be able to ask the right questions and to give the best advice. As usual, you'll find a number of useful resources available at the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. That's rhef.com.au. Now let's meet our expert panel. Firstly, Dr. Trevor Cheney. He's a general practitioner from Bellingen in New South Wales and the VMO at Bellinger River, River District Hospital. He's practiced for 14 years as a rural GP throughout Australia. His group practice successfully blends integrative medicine and complementary therapies into daily GP practice. Welcome, Trevor. Good day. Dr. Ken Harvey is a public health physician with a particular interest in medicines policy. He currently holds the position of Adjunct Associate Professor, School of Public Health at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Welcome, Ken. Thanks, Geraldine. Professor Stephen Myers is the Foundation Director of NatMed Research in Plant Sciences at Southern Cross University. He initially qualified as a naturopath and later as a medical doctor. He also has a PhD in pharmacology. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Geraldine. Dr. Evelyn Tiralongo is a senior lecturer in pharmacy at Griffith University's Pharmacy School on the Gold Coast in Queensland. She is a registered pharmacist with extensive practical knowledge in complementary medicines and in retail pharmacy. Welcome, Evelyn. Thanks, Geraldine. And finally, Dr. John Wardle. He is a practicing naturopath and a research scholar at the School of Population Health at the University of Queensland. His PhD was on the use of complementary medicines in rural practice. Welcome to you all. Thanks, Johnny. Now, John, I wonder if you could just briefly tell us a little bit about your findings in your PhD, because we have a rural mm -hmm. and remote audience out there. Tell us what your findings were. Uh, well, certainly, well, the whole impetus behind doing the PhD was the evidence that suggests complementary medicines used more in rural populations than, than urban, which is kind of a surprise to yeah, most people. Yeah, more in rural practice. And, wow. and even in areas that are well served by general practitioners. So it's not necessarily a, you know, they, they can't find a real doctor, so they go to see a CAM practitioner. It was actually several cultural reasons, I guess, and historical reasons for that use. And the way I like to remind general practitioners is that their patients are more likely than not to be seeing a CAM practitioner, more likely than not to be using a CAM product, and more likely than not to actually be, not want to talk about it with their doctor. So I think this is a very timely um, talk today. So. Yes. Now, Evelyn, we can tell by your German accent <laughs> that you're not born in Australia, and, but you studied pharmacy in Germany. Can you tell us a little bit about your view of complementary medicines and the way we're different in Australia about how we call them these things, complementary medicines? Yeah, I studied in, in Germany, so for me the term complementary medicine is quite uh, strange. So in fact I wasn't introduced to this term until I uh, immigrated to Australia in 2003. So, so for me, during my uh, study in Germany, we were taught on herbal medicine and homeopathic medicine as part of our degree and we practice it as part of mainstream. So it's more like uh, what is effective and what's ineffective. And I think that's what we're trying to bring out today and tonight in this show, that we're trying to go about the evidence rather than calling mm. it too much complementary medicine. Now, Stephen, you've crossed the boundary between naturopathy and clinical medicine. So perhaps, and you're also involved with the TGA, I understand, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So perhaps you can tell us what we should be seeing as complementary medicines. What's the definition? Well, the definition of complementary medicines, and I think the first thing that we need to actually acknowledge is that there is a, a body of knowledge called complementary medicine, uh, which involves both therapies such as acupuncture, uh, traditional Chinese herbalism, Western herbal medicine, naturopathy, and then the medicines, the ingestible medicines that are actually used. Uh, the, the Therapeutic Goods Administration actually says that complementary medicines 
also known as traditional medicines and alternative medicines, are made up of a range of substances that include vitamin, mineral, herbal medicines, aromatherapy and homeopathic uh, products. So it's this eclectic range of different substances. It's important to note that it doesn't include prescription medicines. That's a completely uh, separate component. A complementary medicine may become a prescription medicine, but it's regulated very differently. And it doesn't include any um, uh, parenteral medicines. So if it's uh, uh, for injection, it doesn't fall under the realm of complementary medicine. They used to, de to, to define it by a whole range of different substances, but they've now got a more broader definition. And what would you say would be the most popular or the most commonly used com complementary medicines at the moment in Australia? Well, probably the, the one that uh, everyone in the audience will actually know about is fish oils. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a time that uh, that was actually a very fringe therapy. And I uh, would even question whether it's even a complementary medicine anymore because it's so embedded in, in mainstream medicine well, now. Well, calcium is a complementary medicine. You're joking, really? No, and, uh, <laughs> and folate, which we actually, you know, obviously use in pregnancy to prevent... Every pregnant woman. ...neural tube defect. That's a complementary medicine. It's a vitamin that fits under the definition and is regulated by our Therapeutic Goods Administration as a complementary medicine. Ken, I wonder if I could pass to you about this definition. Are you comfortable with that? Do you, do you think that serves our purpose when we're trying to help people with their comp meds? Well, I think it's important. Um, the other important thing that Stephen didn't mention is that consumers can get a feel for whether something is regulated as a complementary medicine because it has on the label an Ostel for a listed product. And as Stephen said, uh, the regulatory process for listed products is very different to those of registered products uh, of uh, uh, prescription medicines. Uh, it's a more light touch regulation and we can mm. perhaps go into that later. Yes. And uh, Trevor, as a general practice uh, person in general practice who uses these medicines, um, how do you feel about the way complementary medicines are regulated and this definition that we're using tonight? As a, I did orthodox training, I did a scientific training in medicine which I love and respect and I use every day, but I've noticed ever since I graduated there were still holes and in actual fact not everybody fits the paradigm. And I end up, I've seen a lot of patients who do not fit the paradigm and are the 25% who that drug doesn't work for whatever. And they come back to a GP and say, well, what am I going to do now? And so that made me take a scientific approach and say, let's keep questioning. And that's what my training is, to be scientific, to question, what else can I do to service this patient? The boundary of what is complementary and not seems to me to be rather shifty in mm. my practice. Uh, you just mentioned fish oil, calcium. I mean, calcium was in, now it's go actually going out again. Uh, in medicine. Um, glucosamine has been out and then in and sort of now has been questioned but I think the evidence is rising for it. Uh, I use a lot of nutritional therapy which I learnt in basic medical school and then we all forgot when we graduated and that's considered complementary but it's actually essential to basic health. So the boundary for me is fuzzy. When you start learning about these different therapies what it does is actually add a whole new set of tools to your armamentarium. Mm. So you can treat a person that fits a paradigm Orthodoxly, you can f treat somebody who is not prepared to take that paradigm and c have the conversation with them, or you've got this whole new branch of options you can use that also work. Yes, that's right. And it's been shown actually that um, practitioners who have this additional knowledge in complementary medicines are better practitioners because they have a higher self-awareness and also more knowledge about evidence-based practice because they look at, uh, they're looking at those skills not only with regards to complementary medicines but also with regards to their conventional medicines. So now, John, you've done some broad study about who uses complementary medicine. Can you please mm. describe who are the most common users of comp meds? Well, it's not that different from who the most common users of, of health services more generally are. Um, higher education, uh, higher uh, income usually because it does exist as an out-of-pocket expense outside the health system for most people. Uh, generally women, which also use most health services a lot more, and 18, you know, younger women, 18 to 34 usually. And that's probably, a, uh, I guess, a product of the fact that you know, we don't unquestioningly take on what our doctor tells us without actually looking for other options anymore. So do you think it's society. a Gen Y thing? Uh, Gen Y thing, but you know, the, people are more educated about their health. Health literacy is rising. Uh, you know, we, we're seeing the growth of the expert patient, um, and also I think you know, with that with that case of women, there's a lot of women's health problems which don't necessarily fit into conventional treatment really easily. And rather than just accepting that, a lot of women are actually out there looking for options. And does this profile of the patient fit what you saw in your research into who uses comp meds in rural settings? 
Uh, it's pretty it's pretty similar and there's actually been a lot of work done with the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health which generally shows that the same patterns exist. The usage is just a little bit higher in rural areas. And also Stephen, um, there's the question about people, well people always talk about how much money is spent on comp meds. Could you briefly tell us about those studies that have been done? Well, I mean fundamentally the, the interesting aspect of that is that Australians don't actually pay the real cost for medicines out of our pockets. Our government actually uh, underpins the cost of medicines through the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. And, you know, currently the figures seem to be on parity that uh, uh, the public spend about $2 billion um, on out of pocket for, for medicines on the pharma pharmaceutical benefits scheme and about $2, million, $2 billion out of pocket uh, for complementary medicine. So uh, there's certainly you know, good evidence to suggest that the public are, are interested in purchasing uh, these pro products even if they have to pay for them themselves uh, for the benefits that they perceive that they actually give them. So Can I just yes. make a comment there, Geraldine? <clears throat> when other practitioners have probably heard this as well, whenever you talk about complementary medicines, always the lead comment is how much people spend. Um, and I think it's a real distraction. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it also it raises a competition issue. Is it, you know, they're spending that money, they, they shouldn't, the, the complementary practitioners don't deserve that amount of money. Um, it's missing the point. The point is, uh, do we have therapies outside one paradigm that work? And do we have things that are dangerous? And that's what we need to know. And yes. The money is a bit of a distraction. It's important for governments, yeah. not but, for practitioners. But there's a critical issue there. You know, it's uh, from my perspective, one of the problems is the you know 65-year-old woman who might come to see you, who's a pensioner, who has got osteoarthritis, and the option is that you might be able to give her a medicine on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme that might take away a pain, but may actually deteriorate her kidneys and give her a risk of gastrointestinal bleeding, and yet. Equally effective medicines in terms of removing their pain aren't on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. So at some stage we have to talk those economic issues. Mm -hmm. If I could just make a comment there, I mean it's perfectly possible for the sponsor of a manufacturer of a complementary medicine who believes it's efficient and effective to put in a submission to the pharmaceutical benefit scheme and to get it subsidised. And indeed, uh, some have tried to do that. With glucosamine, for example, it didn't get up because it was not thought to have the evidence and the cost effectiveness data there. So again, I mean, the system is not unfair. It simply asks that a complementary medicine person provides the evidence to the government committee and then it would be subsidised. Well, I, yeah, I hear that, Ken, and one of the things that I'd actually argue is that it's in the public benefit that the government actually makes some decisions that certain medicines are in the public's benefit and that, and that actually for those things that are generic and they're in the public domain and that there's no patent associated with it and no company specifically pushing it, that we make those medicines well, available. We'll come back to cost and who should pay uh, for the medicines when we talk about um, which work, I suppose, <laughs> and equity of access. So we'll now go to our first case study, who's John, a 55-year-old professional with a BMI of 27. He has a stressful and sedentary job. He runs twice a week and plays a bit of competition tennis on the weekends to keep fit. But he's also got a bit of hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. He's had that for about five years, for which he takes a low dose of perindopril and amylodipine, 40 milligrams of simvastatin a day, and a bit of low dose aspirin. Lately, he's been experiencing significant knee pain during and after tennis. And his local pharmacist has suggested that he takes 1,500 milligrams a day of glucosamine sulfate, as well as eight to 10 capsules a day of fish oil to relieve the pain. He presents to his local GP for a second opinion on this regimen, especially since it's quite expensive, which is relevant to our recent discussion. So Trevor, let's say that this John presents to you. How would you approach um, him and also his decision to, to follow the pharmacist's advice to purchase these medicines? Okay. <clears throat> Firstly, he's come for an opinion and as a qualified doctor, I, people sometimes forget our job is actually to take a very professional approach to this. Firstly, I want to be asking why is he having knee pain, why is on Prindipril, why is on amlodipine, one of the least um, evidence-supported medications that is one of the highest sellers from a uh, pharmaceutical industry, and why is on simvastatin. And I'd really like to look at all of those things because his knee pain is not just um, necessarily I play tennis, I get knee pain. There are a number of, a number of issues in his history that as a, uh, a doctor, as a practitioner, I need to actually go into first. But 
I'm actually happy to have the conversation with them about the glucosamine and the fish oil because I've also seen evidence to say they're beneficial. But are you suggesting that you, you first want to establish that the diagnosis is correct, that he has osteoarthritis? Abs well, that's right. I'm, wondering, I'm questioning whether he actually has osteoarthritis. But even then, is there a role for fish oil in the management of OA? Um, I believe that's controversial and um, uh, there, I've seen lots of conflicting uh, information about that. Uh, in terms of my own practice, uh, it's one of the options that I discuss with people and people want to try it. Some people come back and say, I can't believe how much better I feel. Mm -hmm. And I can't deny that reality. So if they are that much better, that's fantastic. If they're not, I say, don't waste the money. So should this guy first have come to you before he purchased the complementary medicines? I think it's great that the pharmacist suggested he actually get investigated. Right. And, um, and that's, that's really the key, is a, a team within a therapeutic alliance with pharmacists, the GPs, um, nurse practitioners or whatever, saying, well, hang on, what, what are we missing here? What do we really need to check into this guy? Because it may be arthritis, it may actually be simvastatin-induced muscle weakness and wasting, which at 55 is pretty horrible. That's right. Um, and is actually often ignored. So that actually needs to be looked at. I think at first glance this case looks pretty simple and that mm. they look like effective therapies with very little risk and lots of benefit. But Evelyn, I wonder if you'd like to comment on perhaps what else the pharmacist could have done. If I would case. have been the pharmacist who first seen that patient, I would have not I would have probably suggested those as a possibility, but would have said to see the medical practitioner uh, to actually get a diagnosis. So I would have made a referral to the practitioner and said, you know, what is your knee pain? Is it actually osteoarthritis? And look at your exercise you're doing and also diet and lifestyle issues may play a role for this particular person. And I think as pharmacists, we get trained in, in looking at those things and we should remind ourselves that we should um, look at those um, po other possibilities. And then if you look at glucosamine, there is evidence out there that it is useful in osteoarthritis and it depends really on what uh, evidence you look at whether which salt is really the most effective one and there's a big debate on which product to use but it seems to be that glucosamine sulfate is appropriate but I would have probably also said chondroitin sulfate should be used in com combination with that um, because there is evidence for it and with fish oil um, of course um, with regards to the indication um, it could be used in that patient but it's not as high in evidence for particular osteoarthritis so if you do as a pharmacist if the patient comes to you, I think you need to establish first whether it is the indication what the patient actually has to make an appropriate uh, counselling. Look, I'm perfectly happy with trying to tailor therapy to the patient, but I mean, there are some facts. I mean, glucosamine, as Evelyn said, there's variable evidence. Often it's product specific. Um, it's been taken off uh, the Danish uh, reimbursement system because it was felt that there isn't sufficient evidence to uh, subsidise glucosamine. Um, and fish oil again, I mean there's good evidence for its use in rheumatoid arthritis and certainly for hypercholesterolemia, but uh, osteoarthritis is mm. dubious. Yeah. And wearing my public health hat I'd say, look this, this guy, uh, 55 or so, perhaps it's time he stopped playing tennis. I mean uh, that's pretty stressful on, on joints. What about swimming? What about walking? <laughs> there are easier things to do. I mean you're not uh, young all your life. That's right. And, and also, you know, adding to that is the, is quality of use of medicines actually you know, suggests that we need to actually always ask the question about whether uh, we should be prescribing medicines in the first place. Are there uh, non-pharmacological approaches? And uh, you know, if Trevor's investigations demonstrate that he does have osteoarthritis, then acupuncture uh, might be a very successful therapy. And there's some very good evidence about the role of acupuncture. Sham uh, acupuncture in... or genuine acupuncture? <laughs> no, genuine acupuncture. <laughs> I saw a study recently of uh, a meta-analysis of 18,000 patients, which I think has proven beyond a doubt that acupuncture is very effective for pain management in musculoskeletal problems. Uh, so, you know, there are other things to actually look at. I mean, interestingly, a number of these things may have ancillary benefits. You know, I've published uh, from my research group on the benefits of fish oil uh, in occupational stress, with which, which this guy suffers from. So, as Trevor said, if he finds that the fish oil is benefiting his arthritis, it may be actually having other benefits mm. uh, because it has systemic action. But you hit on a very important point there that uh, people uh, sometimes employ some, let's say, justifications for their purchase of remedies because partly because it's a way of not having to spend the time going to the doctor, but also it's, a, it's like a safe plan B mm. that you can take these remedies and, and even if it doesn't work, it's got some additional benefits and it's sort of healthy. I mean, do you have a comment on that, Stephen? 
Well, look, at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's an issue between theory and practice. I, I believe in theory that we should be able to get everything from our diet and the environment uh, that we live in. In practice, I don't think that actually works out. You know, I live in the country. I came down to city, Sydney for this program. I find the idea of breathing this air in to be pretty intolerable on a, on a long-term basis. Um, you know, I know a lot about diet, yet I know that I err when I'm travelling, when I'm under significant stress. All of the dietary studies in this country have shown that there are at-risk groups for nutrient deficiencies. So, you know, I think that there's actually probably a, a good place for supplementation, and it's part of that, you know, the practice of us all living the, the good life um, doesn't actually really but happen. But do we, we have to differentiate, though, between nutritional supplements and... Uh, remedies that are, are more pharmacologically active substances. You know, this guy won't be suffering from a glucosamine deficiency or a fish oil deficiency. And if he were, then a lower dose would surely be employed. Well, you know, I've heard it argued by James Duke from uh, uh, ex the Department of Agriculture in the United States that maybe some of these people are suffering from phytonutrient deficiencies. I mean, really, if you summed up the whole th you know, last 50 years of nutritional research, it's eat more fruits and vegetables. And, you know, if we all did that, we'd actually be significantly healthier. So I think that there's a place if people aren't, you know, having all of the stuff that they need to have to actually be healthy, to provide some of those supplements that might give them some of those phytonutrients that they need. But, but I think that's an interesting point that you were making as well, that the thing that really, you know, stands out to me, regimen in naturopathic medicine has a very different meaning, you know, to, to, to what's used here, and it's actually that diet and lifestyle. And what we're really seeing here is just the extension of drug therapy. They're natural drugs, but they're just drugs. There's no, uh, I, I guess, you know, uh, and that, that is a big thing in complementary medicine. Without the complementary medicine practice, it, they really are just extra drugs. They may have lower side effects, but they're using that same biomedical reactionary model, and that's generally what's probably causing a lot of that problem with effectiveness. So there are many myths and misconceptions associated with complementary medicine, one of which you just alluded to, that people think natural equals safe, and I think we all mm. understand the, the weakness of that argument. But there are some other ones, like, you know, um, it, I can give it a go because there's no potential harm. I mean, Ken, could, would you like to talk about some of the potential harms associated with the use of complementary medicines? Look, clearly they are lower risk medicines and that's how they're regulated yeah, by the Therapeutic scheduled. Goods Administration. But having said that, that doesn't mean they're without risk. Um, they, some of them have their own side effects. Uh, certainly many of them interact with conventional medicines, which is why it's so important to take a comprehensive history uh, and make sure you know what the patients are taking. And equally well, they can have quite an impact uh, on the patient's hip pocket. Um, these are quite expensive and if they're not actually providing a useful benefit, then that's a problem, especially as often patients can't afford uh, all their conventional medicines sometimes. And last but not least, and, and a particular worry is that sometimes uh, they're used by uh, practitioners and patients as, a, as an alternative um, to a conventional, more evidence-based approach. And that's where we've seen some patients get into really dire straits where they reject conventional medicine and use these alternatives or, instead. Or a delay of more effective yes, therapy. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so they're not without risk. Yeah. Uh, one other misconception, Stephen, I just thought you, you might want to elaborate on is um, the idea that traditional evidence is... Um, uh -huh. What's the usual saying? Something like 3,000 years of Ayurvedic medicine can't be wrong. What are some of the weaknesses in that argument? Well, I think one of the things we have to actually appreciate right from the word jump is that there's a difference between an anecdote and empiricism. An anecdote is that I caught a train today. It's a part of a personal narrative and is generally a single incidence. Empiricism is people actually using observation to be able to uh, determine outcomes. And I would argue and have argued to my medical colleagues on many occasions that herbal medicine, for instance, is an empirical science. It's the, it's the result of trial and error, error of literally probably millions of herbalists over billions of hours of usage over trillions of trillions of patients. Now, as a medical scientist, I'd actually say it's not the highest level of evidence. There are cultural biases, there are social biases, there are observational biases, but it is a form of science. And to back that up, I mean, we did an experiment at Southern Cross University where we took plants that were used in China and plants used in Australia by indigenous Australians that we believed because of the way that they were used were anti-inflammatory. The same plant in both countries uh, used by different populations for 
primarily the same purpose. Um, the pharmaceutical industry would tell us that there's one hit in a thousand plants in random bioprospecting. We got 24 hits out of 30, which is an 800% increase in random bioprospecting. So traditional medicine has actually got a, you know, a value from a scientific perspective as a repository of knowledge. Yeah, but it's still observational data. And John, didn't you allude to this in some of your reports that you've written for the regulatory agencies that mm. there are, there are, we have to remember the weaknesses of observational data? Well, there are weaknesses, but I think there are strengths as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't mean that we should stop at observational data, but I think that observational data does give us somewhere to jump off from. And uh, I was just talking with Ken, uh, outside the Indian government, for example, have actually developed what they call the traditional knowledge database, um, which is essentially digitising old texts from, from traditional medicine as a tool for researchers so they can actually see what was used traditionally, so they can actually do the research from that. So it shouldn't be discarded entirely. Sure. Especially the World Health Organisation is really pushing traditional medicine and over 80% yes. of mm. the world population is using traditional medicine, so we definitely can't dissuade you. Look, God, clearly yes. there's been good Western drugs that have come out of traditional medicine. I mean, aspirin uh, out of willow bark, uh, digitalis out of foxglove, mm. artemis derivatives uh, out of Chinese herbal medicines for malaria, resistant malarial parasites. But equally well, you know, there's been uh, big problems. I mean, we used uh, in traditional medicine uh, uh, bloodletting for 300 years. Um, now, we still use bloodletting occasionally for hemochromatosis and uh, a few, th few areas where it works. But uh, that was again found by controlled clinical trials when you counted the bodies after bloodletting compared to uh, no bloodletting, that in fact, uh, it was very harmful. So the essence is we've got to put this traditional knowledge to clinical trials. I don't think any of us would dispute that. But I think we should also yep. remember that the TGA allows traditional use evidence. They do. And, and I think that is one part which a lot of practitioners don't know. And I think that is important. It's defined in the regulation. We what need to move on to our second Sorry. case study. So our second case study is Shan, a 52-year-old woman who presents at the local pharmacy wanting something to alleviate her menopausal symptoms, <coughs> which include frequent day and night sweats, sleeplessness at night, excessive tiredness during the day, mood swings and increasing anxiety. She, she says that she's heard that valerian and black cohosh are helpful. She's clear she does not want HRT and intends to visit a local naturopath. So Evelyn, what would you suggest for this woman? Well, as a pharmacist, I look at the evidence, and for black horse, the overwhelming evidence is some controversial as well, as of almost every complementary medicine. But for black horse, it says that mostly there is evidence for decreasing menopausal symptoms, especially hot flushes. So black horse is definitely a possibility. And valerian is not used in menopausal or hasn't been tried in menopausal women, but it is um, used for insomnia. There's enough evidence out there that it uh, helps with insomnia. So I would clearly say to that lady that uh, it is a possibility for her to use black horse to to help with hot flushes and try valerian with her um, insomnia. But um, there are obviously risks associated with complementary medicines as well. And so I would point out, for example, with black cohort, although it's a relatively safe herb, there are, have been reports on uh, hepatotoxicity with black cohort. Um, and I would allude to the fact that if she has a pre existing liver condition, that she shouldn't use it, for example, although it's controversial again whether it is really a, um, that bad with regard to if there's a really causal um, relationship between the reported cases and back court. Can, can you go, can you quantify the degree of benefit for this woman's hot flushes? So you say that the black cohosh is particularly beneficial for that. So say she normally gets 20 hot flushes a day, can, can you tell a person how much that might be reduced by? Um, I wouldn't quant be able to quantify it because no studies has really shown that, but it is the, apparently the amount, also the number of hot flushes a day and the severity is decreased from what we've heard. Um, what we've seen in the clinical trials. Right. And with valerian, it helps you to fall asleep, for example, and easier and... Yeah. Ken. Again, I think going back to Trevor's concerns about asking the patient, I mean, I'd be interested in why she doesn't want uh, hormone replacement mm. therapy. I mean, clearly there's been concerns about long, the long-term use of that, but uh, current thought is that short-term use uh, is uh, very effective in terms of relieving symptoms and unlikely to be uh, particularly harmful. And again, it's just something that could be explored. It may be that she, uh, she's she got some misconceptions about this. Uh, there's been a lot of bad media publicity. Uh, it may be it's a, it's a reasonable held belief. Do you but, agree, Trevor? Uh, well, there's a couple of points <clears throat> I'd like to make. Um, one is, although Evelyn can't say how many hot flushes the uh, black cohosh will reduce, I couldn't say the same thing about astalis patches either. 
Mm. I can't tell the woman that that will reduce her, the um, flushes by um, 10 per day. Really, all I can say is that this is the amount of evidence I've got, and we'd like, and, and you can try. This is a medicine I think that would be beneficial for you if, if the diagnosis had been properly made. And, but I will take your feedback. The, the critical question here is she said she has heard of valerian and black cohosh are helpful. What I would like to say is so have I. I've heard they're helpful. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know about valerian, so I'm not going to presume to know, but let's agree that we're going to look into this together. That's right. So surely you'd go and look it up, which we'll talk about later in the program. That's right. Where you'd go. And, uh, and yeah. the thing is, if she's come saying, I don't want HRT, and oh. if I stand up there and say, well, you bloody well should have HRT, we've lost the battle. Of course. If I can say, yeah, I would hear about it, uh, the symptoms you've described could actually be HIV, could be hepatic liver uh, alcoholic liver disease, or it could be hepatitis. So could again, all those she's things. not necessarily just a walking symptom. You have to have a diagnosis. That's right. So don't you? if that's what she's going to do, that's fine. But we'll have the conversation later if you need um, help. And there's a critical a issue that I think is important to actually emphasise there, which is the fact is that there are a range of therapies, and I think you know part of our responsibility as health professionals is to communicate to people what their range of choices are. You know, as Ken pointed out, short-term HRT is effective. You know. Um, Black cohosh is effective. We're currently doing a study looking at acupuncture in menopause, and there's good evidence to suggest that acupuncture is an effective treatment. I mean, one of the things we need to do is to let people know what their range of choices are mm. and support them taking those effective sorts of but therapies. I, th I think that's why it's so relevant to talk about this in the setting of rural and remote practitioners yeah. and patients, because not all the choices are available. So you can talk till you're blue in the face about going to have acupuncture but that might not be an acupuncturist mm. around but the beauty of a lot of complementary medicines is that you can order them over the internet <laughs> in fact we have had a question from a GP in the Northern Territory who asks what do I say to some of my patients who tell me that they can buy CMs from overseas on the internet can't readily get them in Australia is there a quality issue even for products like evening primrose oil for menstrual pain and the answer is don't do it <laughs> <laughs> you know just be very clear to your patients <clears throat> don't do it. The reason for that is there's at least a sort of 30 to 50 percent probability that uh, those uh, those uh, products purchased over the internet are substandard, counterfeit, uh, have no active ingredient, uh, or are adulterated with uh, things that shouldn't be. And again, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has been quite good at picking up uh, those sorts of things. But the message, again, I just reiterate with Stephen: do not purchase <laughs> products from the internet overseas. And Trevor, I believe you're absolutely frightened of remedies from overseas, is that correct? Yes, I think um, there's, I've seen too many uh, stories and cases about, as was mentioned, counterfeit medications, um, and we do not have any control over stuff that has come through that sort of a source. And uh, anybody who gets on their emails all the advertisements for Viagra and Viagra equivalents <laughs> will know that, how much marketing there is in that stuff. And yeah. I think that's what we have to, you know, we, you know, for all its faults, the TGA does a fantastic job in some things and is world leading in many respects. And one of the things that you can be guaranteed of in Australia is that if an Australian product says it has something in there, it has a TGA standard name, so it actually has that in there. So when you're looking at interactions, you can be pretty sure that that's going to interact with that. Uh, in American products, um, they don't have standard names. You may have the one substance listed there four times if it's even on the label at all. So there are safeguards that exist in Australia that just don't exist anywhere else. But, but even don't buy Australian products over the internet because a lot of them are also counterfeit. So that's another problem for mm. some of the, for example, that was highlighted by a Blackmore CEO at one of the industry meetings that a lot of, let's say, of eBay has lots of range of Blackmore's products on eBay and they doubt whether those ones are particularly, they can't uh, tell you whether they are actually made in Australia or not. So again, there's an issue with buying Australian products over the internet from God knows which sources. I think we need to be clear that uh, Australia, there are reputable Australian internet pharmacies uh, yeah, that do produce yeah, Australian regulated products yeah, of good different. quality. Uh, what we're talking about here is overseas eBay. internet, um, and, which, as Evelyn said, can mimic uh, and mm. counterfeit Australian products. But uh, again, the message is uh, don't buy them. Mm. Yeah. I think what, getting back to this case, I think it's very important for us to also emphasise that in talking with patients about their complementary medicine use or intention to use, we need to take an adequate history. So partly, I think I'd like to know, Trevor, what you think if, um, if this lady had a history of breast cancer and also what should we teach those watching the program tonight about taking a history of um, the people's complementary medicines themselves? 
Uh, one of the first things is not to be shocked and frightened to ask the question and to what, hear what people say because they will pick and they'll say, you're one of those doctors that's going to lecture me. Yes. Um, whereas if you can say, as I said, valerian, I don't know. I, I understand what valerian is, um, but we'll look at that. And the black cohosh, I have some information, some knowledge on that. And once you start saying, yeah, let's talk about this, you've actually got a chance to work through whatever the best option is going to be and actually protect the patient from some of the scams that are being talked about here. But that takes time mm. and you can't do it in a six minute consultation. Um, Evelyn, what do you teach your pharmacy students at uh, Griffith University about taking a history of complementary medicines? We actually say um, that, or we teach that they should actually take a, a or take a record of what uh, patients are purchasing, including complementary medicines. And that's actually what we found when we did a national survey of consumers. We found that uh, consumers actually expect pharmacists to take a record um, uh, on, on those products And they purchasing. have to document the actual brand, don't uh, they? Yes, exactly, because it obviously um, not every complementary medicine product is the same. Mm. So you need to really distinguish between products and um, look at the active ingredients and the extracts for herbal medicines. And the dose. Yes, Stephen, I believe so you treat got them a... like medicines, basically. Mm. Exactly, like any other medicine. <laughs> yeah. But but prescription drugs, because often we have generics, they will be more or less equivalent. Mm. People will just put down yeah. the, the active ingredient. Yeah. But you just can't do that with comp meds, no, can you? You don't. Yeah. But that's why if you work in a pharmacy and you're, you're the owner, if you stock products where you know the evidence and you know they are good quality products, then you're already one step ahead. So if you have regulars coming in, so you get to the point where they're purchasing those products for which you know they are quality products, and that's where we want to actually you know, getting to. That's right. We'll talk some more about products in a second. We'll just get on to our third case study, which brings up some of these issues. So this case is Marjorie. Uh, she's a 65-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis. <coughs> she's currently taking hydroxychloroquine. She's also on alendronate for her osteoporosis and a bit of prednisone. She's begun taking a digestive enzyme product that contains minerals as well, which she ordered online from the United States. Uh, the thing is, there are some interactions here and also issues of product quality. So, um, John, could you please comment, please, on how should someone assess the risk of taking a complementary medicine product with their prescription drugs? Well, uh, as I said, I, I would just consider complementary medicines to be natural drugs. Um, some of them actually aren't even that natural, but <laughs> you know, you should just really treat them exactly the same. They're, they're usually pharmacologically active substances with um, a risk profile and a benefit profile, and hopefully the benefit outweighs the risk profile. So I would not think of them any differently, and it, it is really something that I think GPs probably should be cognizant of and actually learn how a lot of these, particularly the common ones, actually do work pharmacologically. In, in this being a real case, the problem mm. was she actually hadn't noticed the minerals. Yeah. She, when they were, when if minerals were presented to her as substances from a doctor or a pharmacist, she would have thought about drug interactions, but because they were lumped into this... And so this so raises so that point of, you know, purchasing something not with that TGA safety that you actually have, because in the US you don't actually... Um, you know, the, the labelling laws that exist there don't necessarily <laughs> uh, come anywhere near the, the Australian ones. So, you know, even knowing what was in there, even if you actually had it, you know, the only way to be sure would you have to send it off for analysis, which yes. you can't obviously do. So. That's right. At least if you bought an Australian product, you would know what was in there and whether it was interacting with your medicine. And I, I think that's a, a, you know, a critical issue that we need to actually just acknowledge. I mean, it's one of the areas that I think the TGA has done, you know, made major mileage in compare, comparison to other countries. Um, back in 1985, they actually mandated that all companies manufacture therapeutic goods in this country to pharmaceutical grade standards, to pharmaceutical good manufacturing practice or GMP. Now, a lot of small companies that weren't able to do that went out of business at that particular point in time. And the industry now, I think, is actually rightfully proud of the fact that, you know, certainly the, the majority of the industry actually follow those standards, I think, uh, with pride. Um, in comparison, in the United States, complementary medicines are made at food grade um, standard. Now, it's not that there wouldn't be some companies who up the ante and, and play a higher game, but there are products in the US market that, you know, um, I wouldn't feed to a pet animal, let alone actually consider taking myself or giving, giving them to anyone that I uh, actually cared for and certainly would never consider giving them to a patient. One of the critical issues is pick up any complementary medicine in this country, pick up any pharmaceutical drug, and it'll have an OST-L 
number if it's a complementary medicine and an OSTAR number if it's a pharmaceutical drug. And they mean that it's part of the therapeutic goods regulation in this country. It's either listed or regulated. And one of the things that the TGA does is to actually determine uh, how medicines are actually regulated based on a risk framework from low risk to high risk. And that risk framework, I think, actually starts to set the standard for how complementary medicines should be regulated And they're the only way that someone can bring in a therapeutic good into Australia and, and legally market it, isn't it? I mean, if there's no Austel or Austar, is that right to say it's illegal? It's illegal, yep. And if so you go to a shop somewhere in, a, a in, in, in uh, uh, an area of the city and there are products on the market for sale and they look like therapeutic goods and you know I think that there's a saying among my colleagues at the TGA is if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck so if it's a bottle and it's got tablets in it it's a therapeutic good and therefore it must actually be part of the Australian Register for Therapeutic Goods and if there's no OSTEL or OSTAR number on it it's an illegal product. And perhaps I could add also that they can, people can actually explore the AITG themselves. You can go online and, and search the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods and if a hunger buster is, or I'm just making that up, uh, any brand of, of a substance that you see as a possible therapeutic good isn't there, that's bingo, isn't it? It means it's illegal. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. I mean, uh, basically Stephen is right, but there are uh, exempt products. Um, mm, yes. Some homeopathic products, for example, are yes. exempt. Again, there's concern about this, and I think the regulations are going to be changed. But uh, mm. at the moment, um, uh, although that's 99% right, what Stephen mm. says, it's not 100% right. Um, Equally well, the fact that you can go to the TJ website and look at the register and see products there, the complementaries, uh, that's a problem too. Because although there's information on the public record about complementary medicines, it's put there by the sponsor, it's mm. not checked by the TGA, and a lot of that information is quite incorrect and wrong. Uh, claims, outrageous claims are being made, for example, by the sponsors. And we have the same problems in promotion too. But I think we're going to come to that later when we talk more. And Ken, just briefly, um, if this product, this digestive enzyme product from the United States had actually been recommended to this lady by uh, a pharmacist or a doctor or a complementary medicine practitioner and sold, even though it's not on the ARTG, is that also illegal? Yes, it is. It is. So I think that's an important point. Oh, yes, it across. is. And, and it is very important. A uh, safety a measure, as Stephen has highlighted, that a, a customer should look at the label to see if it's got an OSTAR and an OSTEL. Mm. And uh, if it hasn't got that, it certainly raises questions. And it's especially important in regard to herbal products. One of the things that the TGA mandated a number of years ago uh, because of issues associated with potential substitution of one plant for another, and it might be done inadvertently mm. uh, at a point source where they're actually getting the raw materials, is that if you put a herb in a product in this country, you have to send it off to an independent laboratory to have it botanically um, identified so that the herb that's on the label is the herb that's in the product. Mm. And I think that's one of the, the guarantees that we have Well, except, Australia. again, it's not quite as good as that. I mean, we've had the problem of adulteration of herbal mm. products. Uh, for example, people may well remember melanin and milk, uh, which is not a herbal product, but it was an example of uh, people c contaminating milk with melanin to fool chemical tests. Now, the same thing, regrettably, is happening with herbal products. Mm. Uh, in particular, ginkgo, one example in Australia was ginkgo biloba a couple of years ago, which looked fine on the the basic tests, but was actually adulterated with buckwheat so that it really didn't contain the ginkgo, but it was meant to, but it filled the chemical tests. Now again, to give credit yeah. where credit's due, the TGA has actually upped uh, the testing uh, on that. But there's an ongoing problem here with uh, adulteration and, and uh, these sorts of things. And yeah, there and, are but other... I mean, I think, I think it's important to actually acknowledge that people who actually adulter medicines are criminals. Yes, yes. yes. And one of the things that, you know, is probably one of the biggest growing parts of organised crime internationally is the production of adulted medicines. There have even been some people from the WHO that have estimated that up to 50% of medicines reaching the developing world may be actually adulted. Or so, just have yeah. no active yeah. ingredient, which is Look, absolutely and, and we, and yeah. If people experience adverse effects from these adulterated ingredients, it's really important to report those adverse events, isn't it? Absolutely. So we might just remind the audience also that we need to hear from the community about adverse events and safety to identify these problems and the Therapeutic Goods Administration will take calls directly and there's also the Adverse Medicine Events line 
uh, that members of the general public can, can yeah. ring up. And health practitioners have got access to the TGA's uh, blue form, yeah. uh, yes. or now it's internet-based. Uh, right. Again, if they're getting a history of complementary medicines and other medicines and uh, getting some concerns about adverse reactions, then uh, fill out those forms, go on the internet to, uh, to fill out the web It's the form. only way we'll know about it. Yeah. It's, very, it's very important that they're asking the patient what exact product it was, That's so right. that they yeah. be able to really specify that on the form and the patient stays anonymous, which is also important oh, to yes. tell the patient. Names don't go on the form. Exactly. <laughs> now we must move on to our next case study, which is one of those uh, heart sink situations where we often see <coughs> complementary medicines used because the person is uh, faced with a mortal illness. So this patient is Mrs Goodwin, who lives in a small coastal town, recently diagnosed with colon cancer, and has had one round of chemotherapy and was very ill throughout and in post-treatment. She approached a complementary medicine practitioner who promised miraculous results using certain herbal remedies. After taking these for two weeks, she began to feel better. The practitioner was, is not registered with any authority and insisted that Mrs. Goodwin trust him and not take any further part in orthodox medicine or treatment. So she stops the chemotherapy and continues with the herbal medicines. And after six months or so, Mrs. Goodwin begins to be seriously, sorry, begins to seriously deteriorate and is in pain. She continues the herbal treatment, but her husband is very concerned and wants their GP to do something. Now, Trevor, I understand you've been faced with similar patients. Tell us what we can do. We're, yeah, we've, we've actually had to deal with very similar um, circumstances. And <clears throat> there's, there's a couple of hard lessons in here. Uh, firstly, we are not our patient's keeper. And unfortunately, people make bad choices. They make bad decisions. Um, and we... Uh, if we can keep engaged in the conversation, sometimes we can protect them from those decisions and balance the information better and interpret it better. Sometimes we can't, and in which case, the, the case that's presented, she's now come back after six months and things looking bad. Um, but I still, even when she's made a bad decision, I'm not gonna judge her because at the, at the end of that six months, she's gonna come back. I'm still gonna need to be able to say, I still care for you. I still respect you as a human. Um, and this hasn't turned out as well as you might have wanted it to but I've still got a lot of therapy I can offer you to support you and most of that will be in conventional therapy. But she's not supposed to engage in any your therapies or... <laughs> so, so now we need, if we've had that conversation and we've had this, as I said, with a patient in our own practice, um, we've got the opportunity to say, is this working for you? Is this alternative therapy working? There comes a time when it's actually not working. Mm. And so will you now talk to me? And I'll be blunt and I'll be honest and open. I need to be able to be honest and open and say what I can do. The big problem with the cases that was originally presented was that it didn't work and her disease progressed. Mm. But what if she was also engaging in therapies that were downright dangerous to her health, say vigorous colonic lavage, you know, and enemas galore? I mean, what would you do? Would you step in? Well, I, I have to be careful how much I can step in because, again, if I actually walked over to her house and held her and said, no, you can't do this, that's an <laughs> assault. Um, so I can. Again, if I can keep the com communication going, I can actually be honest, maintain the respect and say, this is doing you harm, look at what's happened now. If she refuses my advice, I have to live with that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I probably will need the help of some of my colleagues to work through that. Um, other members of the panel, uh, how would you feel, how would you act um, if this patient uh, faced with a mortal illness was actually a 10 year old child? and was being taken to the complementary medicine practitioner who we're presenting as someone who's not registered and perhaps engaging in questionable practices by the parents. I mean, what do we do? Well, in theory, that's assault uh, on the child. It's, uh, and there are legal remedies, but obviously, as uh, Trevor has said, the first thing is to try to get good communication going and to try to sort it out. Having said all that, if that absolutely fails, you have got a duty of care to the child and there are authorities that uh, you can and, and, and must go to uh, if that child is, uh, is ultimately going to be abused. But again, I go back to what Trevor has said, that uh, good communication, keeping the lines open uh, is terribly important. Because there are important communication principles here, aren't there? about um, respecting the patient and so on. Yeah, we have to respect the patient's autonomy. That doesn't mean I, I, I like what's happening to her. And in fact, this, this therapist who's pretending to be a therapist, as, as has been said, there, there needs to be some legal control over that sort of behaviour and, and bring on regulation of, of um, complementary therapies because there are a lot of charlatans out there doing crazy stuff. But 
hey, there's a lot of there are my colleagues who I know do terrible things to patients in six-minute medicine. That's and right. The, the communication is particularly important too because nine times out of ten, if you give a patient a choice between their CAM practitioner and their GP, they're going to choose the CAM practitioner. It's based solely on the fact that they get to see their GP for 15 minutes max each time. They get to see their CAM practitioner for an hour. There's a greater therapeutic relationship, and that's built on communication. So if you improve communication, you build trust, and then the patient can actually trust you to take your advice. Yeah, I, I was actually once put on the spot on a radio program where somebody actually asked me, how do you tell a good complementary therapist? And one of the things that I actually realised, and it was, you know, from my own training and what I actually teach students, is that they have to know the limits of their practice. And I'd say that that's a critical issue for any therapist, is if, you know, basically if you go and see any therapist from a surgeon right through to, to, through to an acupuncturist and you actually say to them, what are the limits of your practice? If they don't know any or they believe that their therapy can cure everything, then, you know, get out of your chair and run for your life because no therapy is perfect. In this case of Mrs Goodwin, what advice would you give the husband who's so concerned? Well, I think one of the issues that I'd probably be discussing with the husband is trying to actually expose Mrs Goodwin to what her full options are. You know, I'd probably be trying to get her to mm -hmm. see somebody who can actually explain everything from the herbal medicine she's taking right through to her options in chemotherapy and radiotherapy and talking through what they'd actually do. Um, you know, sometimes I say to patients, you know, I've done 14 years of university education and if I was in your body with what I know, this is what I'd do. As a husband, and practitioner might be worthwhile also trying to talk to the complementary medicine practitioner, you know, to, if the patient gives the permission to do so, to maybe come up with a combined effort to and maybe maybe even Maybe even, you know, suggest a second opinion from another naturopath yeah. or another yeah. acupuncturist or whatever that CAM practitioner yeah. is, because there are, yeah. you know, I've, I've edited the textbook for naturopathy. We, we actually teach students how to work with chemotherapy and with the acupuncturist do the same, the chiro. This isn't standard complementary medicine practice. So finding some a complementary medicine practitioner that will work with conventional mm. treatment is an option that you can probably talk to a husband mm. about. We have received a question from Linda, who's a, no a nurse in North Queensland, uh, can, about a medicine I've not actually heard of. So I'll be interested to know whether any of you have. How can I intervene on behalf of a child who is being given homeopathic APIS? Apis. Apis. Mm. What is Apis? It's B. B bees. It's bees. It's, yeah, it's related. Homeo it's so bee homeopathic. Sting? From, yeah, from bees. Okay, how can I interview, intervene on behalf of a child who's being given homeopathic Apis for bee stings regularly who is allergic to bee stings? Do you have a response? Um, keep communicating is one thing because um, you can say you can report it to docs, which I've been told to by specialists before, uh, and then you will actually lose all communication and the, the family mm. will be a catastrophe. Or you can keep saying, hang on a minute, um, we need to keep discussing this, this is not working. Uh, can we actually engage some tests to see if it actually has worked? There exactly. are ways you can do that and, and keep putting the evidence in front of them. The question is, why would you want to interfere? Has a um, child been then having an allergic reaction to these homeopathic medicines, which mm. raises the question, uh, why would that be? If it's a high dilution, it would work in a different way. So it's it's a question of whether she's observing an adverse reaction to that homeopathic medicine. And perhaps you can guide this uh, nurse asking the question about what to look for on the product, maybe see how diluted it really is? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it goes into a big discussion about what homeopathic medicines are and, you know, that the diluted ones are more mm. potentiated. It's a completely different paradigm, so it's, it's too difficult to to discuss in this short period sure. of time. But it raises the issue about resources. Yes. So yes. this is a very important issue we need to spend some time on, where to go for information. Uh, and uh, that was a question we have had from Dr. Craig Brown. Um, which complementary medicines have good evidence base and where can I find this information? So for example, Evelyn, if we were going to look up homeopathic apis, <laughs> where would you go to look that up? Well, I'm I would, for the first um, look would be at the review from the MPS, which was conducted in 2009, and the review on the quality of um, complementary medicine information resources. And if you go to the MPS website, um, you actually can still download the PDF file. And um, in that um, review, they were looking at all sorts of different resources, and um, the um, 
the Natural Medicine Comprehensive Database was, for example, one of the ones which they classified as a very good um, to get information from. And this, the one which is listed there as the fourth one, the Natural, uh, the natural Standard Database, was, a, was, a, was another one. And those ones are subscription databases. However, the subscription, for example, for the first one is relatively low. For a three-year description, you're paying less than $200. So really, as a healthcare practitioner, you should look at this MPS review and every pharmacy um, in the country should have have access to those databases and some of the other databases mentioned there are the general ones we go to, um, uh, Cochrane, PubMed, which are databases which also contain information on conventional medicines and we should as health practitioners be familiar with those anyway. And there was another one which was an American based one um, which is quite um, good for, for giving complementary medicine information too and I'm sure she would find some information on homeopathic medicines in those, in those um, databases as well. Because even Google's useful. Isn't it? Depends. Google is a thing. <laughs> Depends. In, in the, but in the old Maybe days, not Wikipedia. <laughs> before Google and Wikipedia, you'd just sit there going, what's that? And hopefully look up a lot of pharmacopoeias. But, but you know, now you can search the world. Now well, you you've got to be very careful, yes. haven't you? Because uh, there's an enormous amount of rubbish uh, on Google. Yeah. Yes. And the key thing is to sort out, you know, what are the good resources. And yes. again, Evelyn's made the point that uh, the National Prescribing Service has done a lot of work on this. There are good resources. I subscribed to at least one of those, um, it's essential, I think, to be able to get that uh, evidence-based resource. And I think it's actually important to actually acknowledge, and I think, you know, one of the things that has a tendency when you get a group of health professionals together discussing complementary medicine is that we get into this rhetoric of danger. Uh, one of my uh, doctoral students did her thesis looking at this rhetoric of danger in a media analysis uh, on herbal medicines. And we talk about, you know, these interactions and the various, you know, negative things that can occur. And I don't uh, uh, disagree that those things are possible. But we also need to look at the fact that there's a wide range of both of benefits that happen and that generally this is a low risk field of medicine. There are not piles of bodies out there in the streets. In the streets. <laughs> um, you know, that there are a lot of complementary medicines that have actually got first class scientific level of evidence for their usage. And, uh, you know, I think that that's the thing that health practitioners need to actually be aware of. Uh, Trevor, what sort of resources would you use? Um, we have a number of resources in our practice and, and, and I actually use the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. Do you have to be a member to access their resources? Um, it doesn't take much to be a member. <laughs> and Jump up and down. And, but they do actually run a lot of courses that for somebody who's, again, scientifically trained and, and is saying, what are these things? Mm. It's a fantastic way to actually start understanding at least what people are talking about and then to decide whether you can incorporate into your practice. But so what do you have to do to access their resources? Um, contact the, the college office in Melbourne. Uh, the Australian money? College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine. Um, they're usually pretty helpful to start with, and if people want to actually, if you want to do a course, yes, you have to pay money. I think the bottom line is that most of these resources are huge, aren't they? Yes. So, that, and, and we have to consult probably multiple ones. John, do you have any other favourites you'd like to mention? Well, I would actually recommend maybe that there's bound to be some CAM practitioners in your area, and some bad ones, but also some good ones. And CAM practitioner training in Australia now actually does have a lot of critical analysis and research skills in there. So they can actually help you, you know, guide you to the evidence as well. And I think that GPs could, uh, pharmacists or, or conventional uh, health practitioners could benefit from actually um, you know, interacting with CAM practitioners on more. And I think that CAM practitioners could actually benefit from learning a lot from the, the GPs, the nurses and the pharmacists as well. I also just want to point out that some of the professional literature, which a lot of um, pharmacists, for example, are using, they don't actually contain enough evidence-based complementary medicine information. So there's a little bit, there, there has to be awareness amongst us um, to tell pharmacists that they have to be careful when they just go f to the MH or the therapeutic guidelines or the MIMS for, or OSDI for complementary medicine information. It's just not enough what's mm. in there and it's not um, as um, actual as we would like it to or be. Or as detailed. Mm. Yes. Yes. None of those resources, which are excellent for conventional yes, medicine, exactly. were recommended by the <coughs> National yeah. Prescribing Service that's Review. Right. For complementary medicine. A, that's right. There, there is a need to go to specific resources. Yeah. And wouldn't yeah. you say also not to forget your basic training exactly. in pharmacokinetics and pharmacology and, and remember to think of things from first principles, yeah. which, again, yeah. you, you might not have spoon-fed from a resource. You might have to think about it and mm. go back to looking yeah. things up. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think critically in regard to that, there are two resources that I would recommend people think about. You know, if somebody comes in and they're talking about a therapy that they actually don't know, um, maybe not Google, but Google Scholar, 
which actually looks at the, the, the actual international scientific literature, and um, also PubMed, PubMed yeah. both two re free resources. And I'm constantly using them as an academic yeah, when I, yeah. you know, somebody asks a question such as uh, this program, you know, um, does uh, soy have an influence in breast cancer? I spent a half an hour on PubMed this afternoon to delineate the fact that it's only in um, HER2 positive individuals that soy is a problem. And, you know, so you can get very specific information very rapidly from those sources. That's right. And, um, John, can you tell us a little bit, about, you alluded to this before, mm. but about complementary medicine practitioners being regulated. Is there any regulation well, at the Well, some moment? of them are quite well regulated. The osteopaths, uh, I think, do a very good job. Uh, Chinese medicine probably do uh, the next best. There are there's some groups that are statutorily regulated but have a lot of professional problems inside, like the chiropractors as well, so there's some variability there. Um, unfortunately, most CAM practitioners are completely virtually unregulated. So, uh, and when you're looking at a profession like naturopathy, you've got uh, 28 associations that are reg recognised by the TGA. You've got um, uh, when the G when naturopaths got GST free status, kinesiologists, homeopaths, everyone started calling themselves a naturopath overnight because there was no protection of titles. So, you know, there is a, it, it can be very difficult to find a qualified practitioner, but there are qualified practitioners out there. Usually, I'd recommend that you find someone who's recognised by multiple health providers, uh, health benefit associations. Health and some, benefit associations. Uh, private health insurers, sorry. Um, oh, right. And health not insurance. just one, but multiple ones, uh -huh. um, because some, some actually have quite lax standards. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, ideally someone who's actually university trained or at least has a four-year degree training um, would be the other thing I'd actually look at. And what should consumers do if they find that the practitioner is uh, not complying with expected standards? What would the process be? Well, I think a lot of people give a bit of misplaced loyalty to their practitioner sometimes. So, you know, just as you'd go for a GP second opinion, I think you should go for a second naturopath opinion, a second chiropractor opinion. Uh, if you're going to see a chiropractor who wants to sign you up for $5,000 worth of treatment straight away, then run away as quick as you can. Um, <laughs> you know, it's about finding someone that actually is treating you like an individual. And if, if, if you've got a chiropractor that's you know potentially financially exploiting a naturopath you know some doctors do it as well some <laughs> physiotherapists do it but you know don't feel like you have to stay with them there are other choices in the complementary medicine field just as there are in the medical field as well we recently had that controversy with the Blackmore's uh, Coke and Fries issue with the companion sales. Now, I don't think that's gone away, <laughs> but um, would anyone like to make a comment about what that reflected in terms of the complementary medicine environment yeah. Look, there's a big problem out there with complementary medicines, and although I'm the first to admit that there are good evidence-based products, there's an awful lot of scams and problems out there, and products that are overhyped and over-promoted. And to some extent, the Blackmore's deal was a sort of example of this. Now, they were suggesting that for four conditions with prescription uh, products that one should automatically consider, uh, the pharmacy should consider uh, recommending a companion uh, complementary medicine. And although there is some evidence that in some people that uh, might be appropriate, it certainly wasn't appropriate as a routine. Um, and it raises again the real questions of uh, uh, was this just commercial uh, promotion uh, to make a buck? And even more concerning to many health practitioners was we know that people are having problems affording the co-payments on conventional medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, to have added on uh, an extra four complementaries would almost certainly mean that some patients would be foregoing necessary uh, medicines. And so this, was an, this is an example of where the commerce really is overcoming the public potential health conflict of interest. And very much a conflict of interest. Yes. And as we, a pharmacist, it can make you really upset thinking about it because you would actually push for a specific um, brand rather than evaluate the evidence for all products out there and taking into consideration the ind individual circumstances of a patient, which we should, and that wouldn't have been really the case in this regard. And for me personally, when I saw this, it feels like it gives the ready to go for all pharmacists to just push any complementary medicine, even those which, who have maybe little or no knowledge on complementary medicines, and those pharmacists still exist. And that's just um, really not a good practice. Great comment, thank you. Now I wonder if we can go to each of you now uh, to get your take home message for our audience please. So John, could we start with you please? Well, okay, uh, well I guess the, the, the take home message that I'd like to put across is that you know we certainly have to be aware of the potential risks of complementary medicine because there's, there's quite a few of them. Uh, but we should also remember the potential benefit and take a measured approach. Evelyn? As a health professional, get educated and know where to find evidence-based information. Stephen? 
I, I think my take home message is that there are two bodies of knowledge. One is the, the rigorously scientifically defined knowledge and there are a lot of complementary medicines that have got very good scientific evidence. And then there's the traditional knowledge which I believe we need to respect. I believe we need to translate that into research but it may take hundreds of years of effort by people like myself to make that happen and in the meantime we have to acknowledge there's this traditional evidence that does have real value to it. Ken? Look, I agree there's good complementary medicines out there, evidence-based, but there's also an awful lot of hype and, uh, and, and really rubbish type products and the challenge is sorting them out, uh, for which uh, some of the resources we've mentioned on this program and critical appraisal skills will help. And finally, Trevor. Uh, <clears throat> basically, to be open to learn with your patients uh, that complementary therapies, especially for me, nutritional therapies, provide an extra set of tools uh, that may be of benefit, but you have to start learning and it takes a long while to learn. It's not an easy way out, it's an extra lot of knowledge. Be sceptical, as the panel has said, about some of the hype, but apply that to both sides of your training. I'm just as sceptical about my orthodox training as I am about nutritional medicines. And, and at the end of the day, remember that arrogance equals ignorance. And uh, the bottom line is that we actually hear to help our patients get well or to do as best as we can for their health and what works for that is what I'm looking for. Very wise. Well thank you everyone and I hope you've enjoyed this program on complementary medicines, the best advice. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making the program possible and thanks to you for taking the time to attend. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised in the program, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website at rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms to register for CBD points. I'm Geraldine Moses. Good night.